All right, welcome to episode four of the Peter Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Clydesdale, reporter from Peter Bro This Week. And uh, here we have two guests on this week. So, Alex, I'll let you introduce yourself to start out with. Uh, sure, I'm a special content writer for Peter Bro This Week. And I wrote um, a story about accessing healthcare for trans people last year, which uh, won the Registered Nurses Association Award for uh, Best News Story. All right, and Drew, you're our uh, you're a special guest on the podcast today, so why don't you introduce mm-hmm. yourself? Sure, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Drew Waltman, and uh, in this capacity, I work with CMHA, HKPR, um, with their Gender Journeys program, and I've been working with them since 2014. Can you tell us what Gender Journeys is? Sure. So Gender Journeys is a program um, specifically for trans folks and questioning folks. Um, it can also be for their loved ones, so it's for a place for people to explore their gender identity or to get support in um, helping their loved ones. So say if they have a partner who's transitioning, uh, then they can go to um, a group for partners to be able to ask those questions that they might not want to ask their partner in case they might hurt them, but they still have different thoughts and feelings on their mind, so it gives them a safe space to explore that. Uh, Now, some money just came to Gender Journeys. It was uh, around $650,000. So maybe you can share with us, uh, from your perspective, why is it important for that money to be there, for that support to be there for people who uh, need those services? For sure. Um, So the... In the meantime, um, when we didn't have that support, the program actually hasn't been running since about March of last year. Um, with the, this funding, it allows this program to start up again and be um, a lot more uh, inclusive of other folks. So it's not just going to be trans folks again. It can be, fo- it can be focused on um, training people, so training employers um, and being able to increase um, access uh, for people. The other thing, too, is that trans folks are extremely um, uh, at risk. They're a very at-risk population, especially for suicidality. Um, And so being able to have these supports increases people's likelihood of being able to have a full and healthy and happy to their definition lives. Um, So it really helps them. Yeah, I know after we published our uh, story about gender journeys receiving funding, uh, one of our reporters did an email from someone who uh, I don't think really realized what they were talking about, but they were basically saying, oh, the like gender journey should fund themselves, they shouldn't get any government funding, but the thing is that this is actually something that in the end can help save lives, mm-hmm. and transgender people are a very at-risk group of people. I mean, is that, from your experience, is that what you see? Oh, definitely. Um, I don't think that I've dealt with a trans person um, in my experience who hasn't at least considered some form of suicidality um, or thought about it, not necessarily carried through with anything, but you know, been in such a situation where maybe their parents aren't accepting or um, their doctor isn't willing to help them transition if they wanted to medically transition, or they're having problems at work where people are being rude or making fun of them. There's just all these different things, or especially young folks at school where they're being bullied. So these uh, different, the support allows people to explore themselves in a safe environment. And again, the fact that um, there's more funding will allow for training um, so that uh, those environments, we're not just helping that one person, we're able to help the countless other folks who may not be out in that space, especially within the school system. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not everyone who is saying I'm trans is the only person there. So Alex, what's your experience from that? Like, what's your experience in kind of looking at this community and then seeing what support is and isn't there? Uh, What are your thoughts? Uh, Well, as a trans person myself, I've struggled to access both healthcare and just um, social supports in Peterborough initially when I came here five years ago. And uh, that's when I found Gender Journeys. And through their support groups and uh, just information, resources that they were able to pass on, I was able to go through my transition and just live a lot healthier, happier life, for sure. That's awesome, and I mean, you're not the only one that's benefiting from that. There, How many people do you know Gender Journeys uh, helps, or do, do you have a rough estimate, or? That's hard. <laughs> that is really hard, I don't know, because you, you know, in 
usually we run, um, when we are at kind of like full capacity, we're running two to three groups plus drop-ins um, in the past. This is what it's looked like before a year. And we usually get like 12 different, uh, you know, six to 12 different people in each of those groups plus different ongoing drop-ins. And then um, there's also uh, parent and partner supports. Uh, and the thing too is that the people that are going through those programs often take those resources and help other people. So it causes a ripple effect. Um, so I know a number of people who didn't go through gender journeys but have been helped by other participants who've gone through gender journeys um, by sharing their experiences or, you know, the support documents um, that, that are there. So it's, it's, it, it really is rippling through the community, which, you know, is what we want. We want it to be that not everyone has to be directly touched by the program to be able to have this impact. Uh, we want it to be kind of that people are self-educating or educating other people so that it, it just becomes the norm that people are accepting of trans folks, that there's not this uh, stigma against people, which will happen eventually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like that for, for, uh, for first, yeah. I like that perspective of kind of that knowledge kind of trading second and third hand and everyone just kind of helping to educate each other. Was there a lot of uh, self-education involved when, when uh, you were transitioning? Well, absolutely. I mean, the structure uh, right now for accessing hormones and surgeries as a trans person is a lot of informed consent. So the most important thing for, for accessing those things is having a really good understanding of what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. uh, and Gender Journeys helps with that, but also they help build connections in the community where you can go and ask questions if you're not sure about something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no, it's it, it, that's one of the things that happens all the time. Is that from from myself, I get messages all um, from folks who've been there, or from folks who know, uh, who've known that person, who said, "Hey, I need some help with this, or what can I give my doctor, who doesn't know a lot about trans stuff, to help them so that I can access hormones, so that I can access surgery, um, and it's uh, providing those kind of support. So sometimes the touches that we have within the community um, as a program, I might only talk to that person for ten minutes because that's all the support." That they need, um, which is fine. Um, and other folks, you know, we have like uh, we have ten week programs that they might go through. So it just depends on the person and the kind of um, support that that person needs. It sounds almost like, and, and you know, just cut me off if I'm wrong here, but it sounds like there almost needs to be kind of like two angles from the uh, from the transgender perspective. There needs to be like the medical angle of making sure that, you know, your doctor is informed and, you know, that your doctor knows what they're doing. And then there's kind of the emotional, how do I handle this angle? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there's, there's more angles than just that, but those, like, <laughs> it's a very, yeah, it's a very complicated thing for people to be dealing with. And mm -hmm. there's so many things to, to, to consider and remember with it. For sure. I think I usually view it similar to that. So there's medical, which not everyone needs, but a lot of people do want to have that. Um, and then legal, so that might be changing your name or changing your gender marker. Um, personal, so social supports, your own personal growth, exploration, and then the supports that you might have, um, so your family or your work. Those are the kind of touch points that you generally you generally see. Of course, there's a lot more, and it's, as you were saying, it's a lot more complicated, but if you're trying to like put it into those easily understood boxes, that's sort of how I see it. I don't know if that's how yeah, you that's see it. Pretty <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. No, it's kind of good to classify what it is. It's like the, the hierarchy of needs. It's like food, shelter, and then emotional. It's like the transgender hierarchy of needs. Yeah, and yeah. it's really true too in terms of um, going back to suicidality stuff when you're dealing with young folks. Um, I'm going to get the percentages wrong, but you can look it up um, through uh, a study that was done called TransPulse, which was specifically on Ontarians, um, trans Ontarians. Um, young folks, people who are, I believe it was from, who were under 20, um, who are dealing with suicidality, if they have unsupportive family, not even just with themselves, but just unsupportive family, um, they're at risk of um, suicide for about, I think, I think the numbers are 70 something percent. Um, but if you have support within um, your system, so your parents or your family members or your aunts or your uncles, whomever you're with most directly, that number of people who actually act upon uh, those thoughts goes down to, I believe, 3%. So it's a drastic difference, the support that people have that, make, that, that helps them. So going through any tough time, whether it's um, related to your gender or anything else, if you have 
supports, that really helps people. And so that's something that we want to be able to do, is to be able to educate those, um, those folks um, and help them be that support pillar for someone of any age. Does Peterborough have enough support for transgender people? Um, I think having this program will be helpful, but I don't, I hesitate to say there's ever enough support because there's people that can't access this program because, you know, maybe the time doesn't work for them because we're limited into certain times, right? Mm -hmm. So I've had people who can't go to any of the groups because the groups have often been in the evening. Um, one of the things that we're looking at doing now that we have this funding is that we'll be hiring on a couple full-time staff because uh, this has always been run part-time. Uh, very part-time by different people, so that will allow for uh, daytime services. But then, of course, there's a social aspect. Is there's not always a lot of social things to do for folks that are specifically identified as trans where you can meet other people. So I think we could always be doing better. And then, in terms of the article that you wrote, healthcare, is that there are some really good medical practitioners, you know, massage therapists in the area, but there's also a huge amount of people that I wouldn't classify as so good, that need to do a lot of personal development and professional development to be able to help the trans community. Yeah, I think as with anything, there's going to be barriers that you face uh, when you're trying to get those types of support. And, you know, these things, like you said, like uh, maybe you work during the times of day that you would be able to go to those group meetings, or maybe you just don't have the ability to travel to go to those uh, uh, events. So. I mean, it, it's always the, the, the struggle of how do you find the best way to start tearing those barriers down. So what are your thoughts on that? On structural change? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, with a bit more funding, you can kind of expand it, have yeah. events at, at more times, um, are better able to communicate to people what gender journeys is. Do you find, do you find there's a lot of people that don't know what gender well, journeys is? Definitely, I think there's a lot of people. Oh yes, for sure. <laughs> yeah, most people that you would talk to in Peterborough wouldn't necessarily know what gender journeys is. No, they, I, and, I, and I think a lot of the times it gets out there because of the word of mouth. So I've known, um, I've had people come because my parents um, have heard of someone who's dealing, you know, with a, a someone who might be trans, and they, they they overheard it, and they're like, oh, you should talk to our son who's with the Jury's program and is also trans to get that support. So even during the period of time when the program was on pause, I was still getting people asking for help, and so I was still kind of having, you know, those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people to be able to assist them. So in terms of change, um, I think making people more aware uh, of what's going on and that there are those supports it would be would be key because there's a lot of people out there who need help that don't necessarily know about gender journeys. And when you're growing up mm -hmm. in Peterborough and you're trans, it feels like there's no one else. Right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, and just in your community, especially if you're in a religious community mm -hmm. uh, with church and your family, there's there's just no there's no uh, there's no way to relate, mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. important to have gender journeys and programs like that. Yeah, just for that reason alone. Mm -hmm. Just having an outlet, yeah, someone that you can talk to and relate to, and you know, okay, this person's not going to be judgmental because they they've gone through something similar to me or they've gone through the same thing as me. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can have those conversations without having to explain yourself. Um, I, one of the things that a lot of folks find difficult is when they're trying to have a really in-depth conversation about what they're experiencing, whether it be about their mental health or how they're experiencing their gender or, or their thoughts around surgery or whatever, that um, they don't want to have to then educate that person they're talking to about it because that adds a whole layer of stress onto it. If you're just talking to that another person that's had that experience, then you know it, you have to you, you get to bypass that entirely. It doesn't have to be this stressful conversation. You can be like, oh, you had that happen too? Me too. Oh my gosh. And then you can just relate to each other, and it feels very refreshing and supportive to be able to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly very happy that gender journeys exist, and I really hope that it helps out people. And you've seen that it helps out people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you very much for uh, being on the podcast this week, Drew. And thank you as well, Alex. Thank you. Thank uh, you for having me. Oh, no problem. And I'm sure we'll uh, talk with you again soon in the future. So, mm -hmm. thank you very much for uh, tuning in on this week's episode of the Peter Podcast. See you next week. <laughs>